I hope you enjoyed your meal. And, and I mean, thank God. I really say that because I feel he wants us to enjoy our food. He gave us, he gave us all our senses, our touch, our sight, our hearing, our smell, our taste, so that we could enjoy those things that we take in. And because of that, I know he wants us to enjoy the food. He gave us a wide variety of things to eat. As I go through the, the sermon today, I'm going to look at food. First, I'm going to look at food. And then I've got a couple of examples. And then I'm going back to God's word. I'm going to look at spiritual food, which is probably the most important. What well, is the most important, not probably, is the most important food of all. And so I will cover the spiritual. And then I'm going to, then we're going to go through John chapter 6, when Jesus talks about food and he talks about him being the bread of life. And so, and then shortly thereafter, I, I want to hit on, on how we become uh, detoxed of the food that we have taken in and how we can be become healthier. So uh, that's a quick synopsis of what we're going to do. Um, as I said, John, God wants us to enjoy what we eat. He wants us to enjoy it. He loves us. He cares for us. Because he does that, he wants us to enjoy it. I tried to think of food. I tried to think of the food I probably enjoyed the most or the time that I ate food. Thanksgiving comes out when we get together with friends and family and spend time together. I was a little short this year, but we enjoyed food. But there was a time, not particularly one time, I can recall when I was a child. And this is this is one of the examples I want to give. When I was a child, my mother, I can picture her now in my mind's eye, putting flour on her table, cleaning it all, putting flour on the table, uh, putting water, mixing it in with the flour, throwing yeast on it. She called them little yeasty beasties. She threw them out in there, and then she would start to knead that flour, roll it together and knead it, roll it together and knead it. <coughs> and then she had a big, a big pan, big pan, and she would place the dough into the pan, cover it with a cloth, and about an hour and a half later, she would take it out again and knead it again. About three times she would do this. She baked seven loaves of fresh bread every week, at least seven loaves. And I can picture that in my mind's eye to this day because of, because of God, because he gave me the, 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 the senses of, of touch and sight and hearing and smell and taste. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. He wants to enjoy, us to enjoy life, to have the fullness of our life. So my mother would, when she got to a certain point, she would take out her bread pans, her seven bread pans, she would sit, and she would take butter, and she would butter the inside of the pans. We, we made our own butter. In the, uh, now, as a child, I did not care for this bread. Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, nowadays, I would, I would almost kill for it. But, but my bread was that stuff that the neighbors bought, that stuff that they could buy from the store for 25 to 7, 27 cents a loaf. It was kind of gummy and gluey, and, but that was my bread I liked. It was soft. It wasn't the best bread for me. Now, we didn't have that bread because my mother, we didn't want to, that, was, that cost way too much. That 27, 25 cents a loaf was way too much. So she made bread instead, which was much better, of course. But she would break, bake this bread out, and she would put it. She would roll it in a little, little bit of little bit of bitty roll about like this, and then she'd put it in pans. In the seven pans, she'd put a cloth over them. But there was always one piece of bread dough that was left, and this bread dough she made into a very special bread, very special bread. Like Christ is our special bread, this was a special bread for us. And she would take it on the counter and she'd roll out till it become about, a, I'd say about a half inch thick or so. And then she would take butter and sprinkle or put the butter over all the top of homemade butter. And then she'd take uh, Watkins cinnamon because the one thing we did, we, this Watkins man came around. I don't know if any of you ever heard of the Watkins man, but he would come around and he would sell all the spices. We bought all our spices from the Watkins man. And she was, and I, to this day, all these senses come alive. And it's, it, it's embedded in my mind what she did. It's, it's grain chiseled into my mind. I can, I can picture to this day. And she'd take that. But then she'd get out a cake pan, 
uh, nine by 13. Anybody who's done any baking, they know what size of pan that is a cake pan, regular cake pan. <clears throat> and about the same time, she'd take a put a put a pan of uh, on, on the stove, a uh, cooking pan, and she'd put a, a corn, a little bit of corn syrup in there, a little brown sugar, a little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of a cream that we had, we had our own cream on the farm, and she'd put that mix it and get it slow heat and started going, and she'd roll the good back to the bread. And when we got back to the bread, she'd roll out this bread, sprinkle it, and she'd roll it into a roll, a log. I guess the best way to describe it is a log, and then she would cut it, cut it in slices diagonally, uh, slices about a half, I'd say three quarters to an inch thick. Then she'd take the the uh, Goop she was making on the stove, and she'd pour it in the bottom of the pan. She'd pour it all in the bottom of this pan. And then she'd take these rolls, turn them upside down, and put them in there. And then she would cover this. Well, she would bake her bread first, and we had that. We could smell the bread coming out. Uh, again, it's, it's embedded in my mind. It's in my mind's eye. And God, I think, wanted me to remember this. It was in my mind's eye. It's always there. And... Then she would take this pan, this leftover, this really good bread, and she'd put it in and cook that. And when it, when it got all done, she'd take wax paper out, she'd put it on, and she'd turn it upside down. Now, uh, anybody who's done a little, a little cooking knows what she probably made. She had cinnamon caramel rolls, and they were so good. I, I mean, just I can, I can taste them. I can taste them. Yeah, I mean... They were about two inches, two and a half inches high, and a, and a goop ran down. I, I can feel it on my fingers. I can, I, I can touch it. I can feel it. I can sense it. I mean, I can do all the senses come alive when I, when I see that, when I think of that. And those caramel rolls never had a chance to cool down. She had to keep us away from it because we still have to let them cool a little bit because we couldn't eat them that way. And so that was that was to me was was great comfort food. When I think of that, my brothers and I, when we go back there later, and she she couldn't bake anymore, we found out downtown there was a little restaurant that made fresh caramel rolls, not cinnamon rolls, fresh caramel rolls every morning. Guess where my brother and I were? Right down there. Before anything else, we were down there eating those caramel rolls. They had to nuke them because they they had cooled, but they nuked them and we ate them. But to me, that was comfort food. That was comfort food. And as I did the study, I thought, wow, I said comfort food, the best bread. And I thought of Christ spiritually being the best bread. Okay. And when he left, what did he do? He said the comforter, comfort food, so that we could enjoy the things that he had given to us, that, that he would, the comforter would remind us in our minds of what God had done for us, what Jesus had done for us. So. Uh, just thoughts as I'm going through this. Um, there is wrong food for us to eat. That was another thing that was important as I studied this. There's wrong food. How do we know what's wrong? Well, we know. We know. Uh, I, I, I want to take one thing out that I know is wrong. And it, we, we've got to a point where we eat too, way too much sugar. Way, way too much sugar. And it has a negative effect on our bodies. Uh, we gain weight. Uh, we have increased risk of diabetes. We have heart disease. We have fatigue. We have cavities. We have all sorts of things that we have because of of the sugar. And sugar, some people say it's like cocaine. You get addicted to it. You, it's hard to get off. It's hard to get detox from it. You're you're on it. it you're you're hooked. It affects your brain chemistry. Uh, it's about as quick as I can go. I still get mass details, but it affects our brains. We don't think right. We got this stinking thinking. We got to have more sugar when we really don't. Uh, the manufacturers add it to all the stuff. Uh, my daughter decided to go on a sugar fast. She was not going to have anything with added sugar to it. And she called me up and says, and she doesn't eat much sugar to begin with. And she called me up and says, Dad, you wouldn't believe all the things they put sugar in. You would not absolutely believe it. And she's, I can't eat this. I can't eat this. And she went through the whole list. For 30 days, she did a sugar fast. And she went through withdrawals. Now, I didn't think she was really into sugar that much. I've never seen her eat much. 
she's a pretty healthy person. Um, but, but she said she had problems. Then later she said, I had something with a little bit of sugar in and it tasted so sweet. It was just overpowering. So we, it's something we don't need. We don't need all the sugar. Um, I was, I was sitting, looking at a picture of my family. I'm just talking about food now. Looking at a picture of my, my father's family, my grandpa, my grandmother, my dad, his brother, and his four, his four sisters. And I looked at the picture and said, wow, none of these people are fat. Yet my brother, myself, and other members of my family, we have a tendency to gain weight. I said, well, why, why is that? Well, uh, you think about it, they were very active, physically active. They were active all the time. They were burning this fat or burning this stuff they ate. My dad poured, poured cream over his bread in the morning. Cream. And, I, people, and I'm, ta I'm talking farm cream, not this slight stuff they sell in the store nowadays. I'm talking, looks like syrup. And he put choke cherry jelly on that bread my mother made. And then that was, that's what he had for breakfast. So I said, he'll have a heart attack. Well, uh, no, he didn't die of a heart attack. He died at 94, but he was active and he was never fat. Active his whole life. And so I said, wow. So it was important that we stay active. We, we do things. Uh, uh, there was a word that came to mind as I was thinking about the sermon. It's called masticate. Anybody heard, ever heard of that word masticate? It means to chew. My mother used to say this. We sit down to meals. She says, make sure you masticate your food. Well, I haven't heard that word for years, but when I studied this, I started thinking about it. Masticate, chew your food 20 times, 20 times, because it helps in the digestion of your food. Plus, it fills you up sooner. Well, that's maybe one of the reasons why we didn't gain much weight as kids. We ate, we chewed our food. We ate three times a day, three times a day, which was good. We didn't have to eat all the time, we ate three times a day. We've gotten to a point, I thought, we've gotten to a point in our society where fast food is the only thing. We don't sit down as a family and eat together. We don't spend that time together. And it's important when we eat that we spend the time together eating, that we masticate, our, that we chew our food 20 times. It's important. Uh, as, I, as I thought of this, I thought of a... a a quote in the book of Daniel, uh, where he's told, close up the book until the end times and people be running to and fro, okay? And knowledge shall increase. I said, wow, we are there. We are there. We don't have time to sit down and eat a decent meal. We quick run run to Mickey D's or some of the other, and get, get a quick bite to eat, and we're on our way again. We don't have time to spend with one another and family. So that's some of the things I was thinking about. How do you How do you quit? How do you quit? How do you detox from this, from this thing? Well, God tells us. God always has the answer. Uh, how do we detox? And I, uh, and, I, and I thought, well, did you ever detox from something? And I thought, well, yes, you did. Stanley, you did. When you come back from Vietnam, you were smoking three to four packs of cigarettes a day. That's 60 to 80 cigarettes. Now, I said, I always said I can quit anytime I want. But after all, I had quit dozens of times. I was an expert at quitting. And and, but I got to this one point, and I, I had been reading books. I was in college. I was actually studying for final exams, and something happened. I won't get into it, but I said, nothing has controls my life. Nobody tells me what to do. I was a Marine. I had complete discipline of what I wanted to do. Nobody controlled it. And I, I was wanting a cigarette so bad. I said, you know, that weed, that plant controls your life. It isn't people that control it. That plant controls your life. You've got to quit. You can't let that plant control it. So I just said, I'm going to quit. I had read enough about it and said, well, what you've got to do is if you quit something, you've got to replace it with something else. If you quit something that's bad, you've got to replace it with the good. Ergo, we get to the spiritual end of it. But if you quit bad, it's got to be replaced with something good. And so I thought, well, what can I replace it with? I was not a Christian back then. But I believe God had the answer. Well, I know he has the answer. Because he loves us even if we are sinners. And I said, well, what I can do, I will, every time I want a cigarette, I'll drink a glass of water. Well, that's a lot of glasses of water in a day if I want a cigarette 60, 80 times. Well, basically, I and boil down to whenever I just really desperately, direly need a cigarette, not when I just had this quick urge, but when I really, then I drink a glass of water. Well, the thing was, I became so bloated by the water, I didn't care to think about cigarettes. And it flushed my system. It cleansed. It cleansed my system is what it did. It cleansed me. The best thing that could ever happen. 
And and that's been what 50, 50 some years ago now, or forty some, I don't know, whatever. It's been a number of years, and I haven't smoked, and I've gotten rid of it. I would I smoke? So God cleansed me of that. Well, in my study, I had to go to the Bible because God has answers. And I thought, well, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to what God says in the beginning. And so I said, well, I can Google it. I said, what is the first time food is mentioned in the Bible? And that's what I want to bring up first. Genesis 1, 29. The first time food is mentioned. And God said, see, I have given every herb that yields seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. You sh it shall be, it shall be, to you it shall be for food. And he says, also for the beasts of the field. So everybody was vegetarian at the creation. That's what it tells me. Okay. The word, the Hebrew word is okla. Okla. He gave it to okla. Now, okla, I always have to go to Strong's Concordance and look up what this word really means. They translate it as food, and it is food, but it's more than that. It says, it shall be for consumption. We will take it in. We consume things. We bring them into our system. It shall be for consumption. Well, it is also translated, and sometimes it's translated as fuel. And it talks about uh, okra being fuel for the fire, okra for the fire. It, it is consumed by the flame. It is when, when what is being consumed burns out, there's no more flame. And that's what I was talking this morning about. We are burning fires. We, we keep our flames alive. We're alive. As long as the flame is burning in us, we are alive. And God wants to be alive. The fuel, food or the fuel we use is all things that come from outside of us and enter. We don't have it inherently within us. We bring it in from the outside. We consume it, and it becomes a part of us. I'm skipping through a few things, but it becomes a part of us. Um, and it is used by for various things. Well, I read on. Uh, the first time anything was added to us was in Genesis 2, when it talks about and. God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. We were nothing but dust. We were nothing but clay. Okay. And then something outside of us breathed life into us. It was food for us. We, we consumed that life and we, we lived and our, the flame burned within us. And he wanted to keep that flame alive. Okay. Does this make sense to you? I don't know. I, I see somebody shaking her head. Yes. Okay. Um, so, the, so we're alive. Next verse I run into, what does God, why does God give us food to begin with? Well, a lot of things we do physical, they're a good example for us what we're supposed to be doing spiritually. We can understand the physical, but sometimes we have a problem understanding the spiritual. But if we understand the physical, we can understand the spiritual. Okay. What did God do then? He, and in verse uh, 15, uh, verse 2.15, Genesis 2.15, the Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it. That means to work. God wants us to work. As my father and mother worked, he wants us to work. He has a work for us to do. Okay? And he says, oh, you can eat anything in the garden. I've given you all these things. I've given, I've given you all these senses. You can taste You can taste what an apple tastes like or an orange. Wow, all these. But you need this stuff to consume, to burn, to keep you alive. You need it. I'm not just going to give you plain old gas. I want to have you enjoy life, all the various flavors. And the, I want you to have a wonderful life. That's that's the God I have. I love. He's a good God. He loves me. He wants me to eat the best, the best of everything. And he did say in there, but, 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 that three-letter word, but, 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 don't eat of the tree of life. Because we were in the garden for not only to live, but we were in the garden to learn. He created, we were like, we were like a blank slate, and God came with knowledge to teach us, and we were to take that knowledge and gain wisdom, because wisdom that is, after all, the correct use of knowledge. And we were to gain wisdom, and to, and to eventually have the character like God's. We had the choice to make. Well, eh, what happened? We 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 didn't we didn't do, we started developing a deformed character, 
not like what God wanted. We started taking in the food. We started at the tree. We ate the tree, and they said, oh, it's still good for you. And, uh, and our character became deformed. It wasn't what God wanted us to eat. It was something else, and it deformed our character. And in Genesis 3, it talks about the fall, the food that caused the fall. And it says, and when the woman saw the tree was good for food to be consumed, because that's what the devil told her, and pleasant to the eyes. See, we take things in with our eyes, not just our mouth. We take things, we eat things with our eyes. It looks good. Uh, those caramel rolls sure look good. Every time I see one, they sure look good. I take it in with my eyes. I see it. I don't have to smell it. I can already see it. And I, I, know, what it I know what it tastes like. Okay. It's what we focus on that becomes so important. She focused on the tree. On that food, what she shouldn't have. And because of it, and it said because she thought it was, it was something to make her wise, and she wanted to become wise, she's going to jumpstart the Lord. Said, well, I'm, I don't need you, Lord. I'm going to jumpstart. I don't need to spend time in your word. I don't need to spend time with you. I'm going to, I'm going to eat whatever I want to eat. And, and she did. Well, eventually, so it, it didn't take long. And the sin, sin was in the world. Man fell. And then a few centuries later, uh, God destroyed the earth, and and he, and Noah and his family were saved. And I've got a little bit. To, and at that point, they were no longer vegetarians because God gave them all the unclean meat to eat, all the unclean food to eat, meat. Okay. But it said he said one thing. It said that you could you could eat the flesh, but but you could not eat anything with its life. That is its blood. Blood is life. This is an important part in, in our food study. Blood is life. Life is blood. Okay. So, in short, we consume things in our body. We have our five senses go out, and, it, and we sense if it's good or if it's bad. We bring it in, we consume it, and it becomes a part of us. We use it to, to live and breathe. We use it to grow and change. We use it to work. All this stuff outside of us comes into us. And we are able to use it to change. Uh, we assimilate this outside forces into our into our own being, and it becomes a part of us. Now, switch again. Let's start. Let's start looking at Jesus, our example. Uh, and, I, and I thought I thought of a quote of one of my favorite authors in a book called Desire of Ages said something. We were supposed to be developing character in the in the garden. That was, that was where the knowledge was. She says, none but Christ can fashion anew the character that was ruined by sin. Only Christ can detox us. If we're eating the wrong stuff, we're taking the wrong thing in, whatever it is, only Christ can detox us. That's the word today we're used to hearing. Detox, detox. Only Christ can detox us. He can form the character anew, a new character the character that he originally wanted to form in the garden. So how do we do it? So we go back. Okay. Uh, Eve fell in the garden. Adam and Eve fell. So Christ was the second Adam, as most of you know. Christ was second Adam. And what happened to him? When he became baptized, what happened? The devil, not the devil, uh, the Holy Spirit took him out to be tempted of the devil. And for 40 days, he was in the wilderness, and he didn't eat. And when he was about to die, he was at the point of death. If you don't eat for so long, you get to that point. The devil came to him and said, hey, turn this rock into turn this rock into to food, into bread. And his comment was, what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How do we live? By the word of God. That is what we live by, the word of God. And Christ was the word made flesh and dwelt, that dwelt among us. Can you, and I, and I started thinking about Christ going following the spirit into the wilderness. And I thought about our lives at this point. I was thinking one of our lives. Do we follow Christ into the wilderness? Do we follow him? He says, follow me. He wants us to follow him. And my answer is, uh, it's difficult for us. I mean, I have to be honest. 
if if my wife and I get into the car, uh, I like to drive. What's that say? I'm selfish. I want to be in control. <laughs> I don't want to get in control of somebody else. I want to be in control. Okay. I don't know how many of you are like that, but that's the way I am. I'm sorry. So lately, I've been allowing her to go, allowing her to. But then, how would it be if I say, if she said, "Okay, come on, get in the car, we're going." And and I said, uh, "What would I say?" Well, where are we going? Don't matter. Just follow me. I'm going. Follow me. How many of us would say, "Follow the Spirit wherever He leads"? We don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to go wherever He leads. That that just blows blows our mind. Blows my mind, anyhow. Okay. Now I want to get to the. Again, the scene changes. I want to go to chapter 6 of John, and I'll be in chapter 6 for a while. This is a chapter where Jesus feeds 5,000. We all remember the chapter. He's on the hillside near the, near the Sea of Galilee. He's on the hillside, 5,000 people, and he's taking sympathy on them, and he, and, and he wants to see they're hungry. They're, they need food. And uh, what are we going to feed the disciples? What are we going to feed them? And somebody said, well, this young lad has what? Two small fish and five barley loaves. Barley, lo barley is the cheapest of the grains. Barley loaves. So he didn't have much. This young man did not have much, but God took it, prayed over it, and fed 5,000. It tells me we don't have to have much. We just have to be willing to give whatever food we have. Whatever we have to give. And we have food because if we have God's word in our mouth, his word is food. We have food to give to people. And if it's God's will, that food will feed many, 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 many people. <coughs> We're talking spiritual food here. Uh, so what all happened? Well, he, feed, he feeds the 5,000. And what happens? They, they rise up and they, and they remembered that their forefathers were fed, fed in the wilderness for 40 years by manna. And they're going, wow, he is, let's make him king. We'll have food forever. He is in charge. He can give us food. He can satisfy our needs. Let's make him king. Well, Jesus did not want to be king at that point. And so he escaped up into the mountains. He went up into the mountains. The disciples, meanwhile, crawl on the, uh, this is a whole, I'm giving you a whole quick chapter of, uh, chapter six of, of uh, John, uh, they crawl on the boat and they go across the across the, over the sea. About halfway across, about three miles out, they, they have a storm hits them and they're sitting there. Well, and Jesus come walking across the water and he comes over and they, and they come on the other side. The bottom line, they're on the other side. Well, all these five thousand are sitting on the other side. And they said, "What happened? He was here. There was no other boats." And now we know he's on the other side. I don't know how they knew five miles away across the ocean. They were, evidently, there must have been other boats or something out there. But they knew Jesus was on the other side. And so they went over and I said, well, they were talking about this food. They were con so concerned about the food. Their focus was on what God had created for them instead of the creator. God, Jesus did not come to satisfy their physical hunger, but to satisfy their spiritual hunger. He came with the better bread, the caramel roll, the best of the bread. He wanted, he was going to give them the best. They they wanted to be, they were they were content with being satisfied. They were going to make him king because they were satisfied. He ultimately wanted them to be glorified. There's a big difference. The spiritual, you eat that spiritual food, you can become glorified. You eat the other other food, you can become satisfied. And I say, don't. Merely become satisfied with what you've got, but become glorified. Follow God and be glorified. Okay. Uh, John 6. Uh, I'm trying to move along. I want to get done in this half an hour here. So John 6, uh, 32 and 35, Jesus begins to talk to the crowd. He begins to tell them who he is and he uses this word, I am. And we know where I am comes from. I am the bread of life. He, I am what I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yep. He uses the same thing his father used. I am, I am. He is the great I am. Most assuredly he says, I I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but three-letter word, but my father gives you the 
true, true bread from heaven. When I read that true, I said, well, that means there's also false bread. He gives you the true bread. The true bread comes from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, this life is Zoe, and it means much more than life. It means meaning and purpose. It means meaning and purpose to your life. It gives meaning and purpose to my life. God gives meaning. And I was at a point where I didn't know what to do. And when I found Jesus, I found out I had meaning and purpose to my life, and I was satisfied. I no longer hungered for certain things. I no longer, why am I here? What am I doing? I knew what I was doing. I was following Jesus and doing his will. Verse 34 says, and they said to him, Lord, give us this bread. He said, I am the bread of life. Give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Bread is a basic food. The basics, the basic. Not only is he good, he's the caramel roll. And he who hungers shall never thirst. And he who believes me shall, I mean, who hungers shall never, he who, I'm going to start all over again. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And I, and I thought, well, earlier he talked to the woman at the well, and he told her the same thing. You should, you'll never thirst. You'll never have to come again to draw water. I'm going to satisfy you. Now, now these, now these, this 5,000, they were, somebody, somebody said, they, they were satisfied with fish and chips, so to speak. They were satisfied. And they were content to receive that, and that was it. But Jesus wanted to give them, I said, much more. He wanted to give them life and give them life more abundantly. He wanted to have fullness of life. And that's what he came to give us, that food, that which we can take in, and we can live and breathe and, and lead a full, productive life, bringing glory to God, our Father, our Heavenly Father. In John 40, 640, Jesus said, for this is the will of my Father, that anyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up in the last day. Believes, beholds, beholds and sees. He gives us one of the senses is our eyes. If you take in, you take in with your eyes, if you see Jesus, if you see Jesus, and you believe, you have faith, and you trust in what, and trust in his word. You believe in his word. You don't have to find something else outside, something that's not true. You trust in his word. You take it in. That becomes food for you. You consume it. You consume God's word. You consume Christ. You consume his word, and it becomes a part of you. It joins you. So I don't know. I don't know exactly how, but it becomes, a, it's assimilated into you. Uh, in verse 54, about 14 verses later, he says this. He who... He who eats my flesh, remember he is the word made flesh. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal, has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Same thing he said earlier in 40. And somebody said uh, they have a ge uh, geometry, uh, Euclid said something. Uh, things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. So if we drink his, eat his flesh, Eat, eat his, consume his word. We consume the word of God, okay? And what we, and believe in him and drink his blood. The blood is the life. We take his life into us. We take his life because he lived, we will live because now he is a part of us. Does it, does it make sense? His life becomes, it lives within us. It's assimilated into us and, and, we, and we taste the food we, we eat the food, and what what we were, we no longer are. We're consuming good food, not not the bad food we used to eat. So we, we eventually will become detoxed. Okay, a little bit more, more on toxin. Verse fifty five and fifty six, he says, "For my my flesh is true food." Often he's mentioned, "I am the way, the truth, and life." Remember, I said. It is true food, and my blood is true drink. Is life for you. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. We are assimilated together. We are one. We are one. We're combined. 
we cannot separate us. We are we are congealed together. His life because he did never sin, and because of that, we are were tied to him. And the living father sent me, and I live because of father, because of father. So he who feeds on me shall live because of me. So because of his life, we drink his blood, life is in the blood. Because of his blood, and it's a part of us, part of our life. And the food, he is the word that flesh is made and dwelt amongst us. Because of the word, we are being detoxed, spiritually detoxed. Uh, Paul understood all this. And I said, when he said, do not be conformed. Don't continue doing the same thing of the world, but be transformed, changed by what? By the renewing of your mind. As our senses pick up things, we bring them in and they become part of our mind. They become ingrained in our mind. And we make all our decisions. What we do in life is based in the mind. This is the food we take in. This is what we eat. We're supposed to, uh, another, I got some quick quotes from, uh, therefore, First Peter First Peter 2 says, therefore, putting aside all malice and hypocrisy, evil and evil, envy and evil speaking, as newborn babes desiring the pure milk, the basic food of the word, that you may grow. Food makes us grow. If we take in God's word, we grow. We become more and more and more like him. We become detoxed. Um, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify means to cleanse. To drink that water like, like cigarettes. <laughs> You're drinking his word, taking his word, and you will be sanctified. You will be cleansed, and you'll become a new creature. You will no longer desire the old things of, of the world, but you you're, you're, you have a new character. Uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, uh, uh, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's one, not on the Sermon on the Mount, but that's not. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Filled. If you hunger and thirst for what is right, for God's word, you take in his word, you will be filled with him. And in turn, you will become like him. Uh, but we're not to be hearers of the word only. We're not to just have faith. Because faith without works is dead. We have to work. As in the garden, they had to work. We have to work. We have a work to do. And what does that work? We'll get to that. That would be the final point. Um, I think my favorite verse in this, what we're to eat, it says, finally, brother, whatsoever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report, if there be any virtue, be any, 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 any praiseworthy, meditate, meditate on these three. And I underline the word meditate because meditate is the same as Masticate. Chew it on it. You don't just take God's word as fast food, quick read it, and that's it. You take the verse and you look and you meditate and you chew and you chew and you chew and you chew and you meditate on it. And it becomes a part of you. And you get every piece of, of nutrient out of that word that he's given us. Got to be careful what we eat. Again, my, my favorite author uh, uh, and on a book called Ministry of Healing. And, and as I, it's a thing I see sometimes uh, we as Christians ha want to do. We shouldn't, but we, I hate to say it, we're, we're, we're kind of sometimes drawn to it. When we see something going wrong, we want to we correct it, which we should. But listen to this. Earnest workers have no time to dwell upon the faults of others. So if we see brothers or sisters who have certain faults, and we all have faults, we cannot afford to live on the husks of others' faults or fit. The husks, you know what husks are? Husks are on the outside of the, the meat of the grain. It's, it's nothing. You get no nourishment out of it. Evil speaking is a twofold curse, falling more heavily on the speaker than upon the hearer. He who scatters seeds of dissension and strife reaps in his soul deadly fruits. The very act of looking for evils in others, looking for evils in others, develops evil in those who look. 
by dwelling, and I wrote on the side, meditating, <laughs> masticating, by dwelling, dwelling. I mean, you not just look, glance at it, dwelling on the faults of others, we are changed into the same image. We are what we eat. If we continuously look for faults in people, if we continue, we become like that. Instead, but then she says, but, three-letter word, I love this, but, but by beholding Jesus, by looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, take, talking about his love and perfection of character, we have become changed into his image. We are what we eat, what we take in, what we consume. We can look at the faults. We can look at all the evil. We can, it doesn't mean there isn't evil in the world. We see it. Uh, and I and I see people who uh, attack a president, one or the other. And I've seen different presidents. One will attack, and and they become so caught up they can they can't see that they they're becoming like that person. Uh, we need to pray for those who have faults. We see them, but not meditate on. We know they have faults and say, Lord, I notice that so and so. Uh, only you can change their character. I have read that earlier. Only Christ can change the character. So we need to pray that Christ will. Work on this person, changing their character. Um, and as far as work, I got one final thing. As far as work in the garden, uh, I just caught this a, a couple days ago. In the garden, God had Adam and Eve tilling, uh, tending the soil, tending the soil. And I said, what are we supposed to tend today? What is supposed to be our work today? And I, I thought of... Uh, uh, in John, uh, it's my favorite gospel. And in, in John, um, Jesus is talking to Peter, and uh, Peter had denied him. And and Jesus said, "Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me?" And he says, "You do." And he said, first thing he said, "Feed my lambs. Feed the little ones. Feed the ones that are just coming into the church. Feed them. Give them my word. Point them to me. Let them consume me. Feed my sheep. Show show them me. Show me. Show them God's word." So they can be nourished. And then he says, again, tend my sheep. Work. That the tending is the same in the garden. We have a work to tend God's sheep. Those that have found the word to tend them, to, to feed them, to make sure this is our work. This is what God has us do. This is why He's taking care of us, why He supplies our all of our needs according to His riches and glory. How we're just looks to Him first of all, and He will take care of all these other minor stuff or what you know what we'll take care, care of physically. He will take care of us spiritually. And then again, he says, feed my sheep. Give them the word. And that's, that's what we try to do. That's, that's what we should try to do as Christians. Feed, strengthen those around us. That's what we do as a church. We come together and our words that we speak, we encourage. We don't discourage people, but we encourage them. We strengthen them. They become more powerful. They burn brighter for God. Uh, that, that life's flame within them is, is hotter and hotter. Uh, and I think Jesus is a consuming fire. I said, where, and I thought, where does he get all this that he consumes? It takes, it takes something to burn. We are to praise God continuously. He feeds on the praise. He consumes the praise that we give him. And he burns bright. He consumes those, those that are not following him are consumed by the word of his, by the word of his mouth. They don't have the word. They don't have the praise. They don't have the thanks. They don't have the word to give to our heavenly father. God is good all the time. Uh, we need to praise him. We need to thank him. Not only just a Thanksgiving, but every day of the year. We need to feed him the word that he's given us. Giving it back and say, hey, father, thank you. And he takes that in and in turn, he is glorified. And when he is glorified, we are glorified. It's a, we, we are one with him. We are we're assimilated together. We have one goal, one purpose, uh, to glorify one another and to glorify him, to see that we're glorified, to help, to lift up. That We are what we eat, and our church will prosper and grow as long as it's fed properly. If we don't feed them, we die. That's it. I went about five minutes over my 30 minutes. but <laughs> Father, let us look to you. 
the best bread. The carnal rule of spiritual life. The one who gives us eternal life. The one who through we will be glorified. We will be lifted up. We, the one who through we will spend eternity not only with you and praising you. But being with you and learning at your feet. Being humble and learning. May we continue to be humble. May we continue to look to you to all our answers in our lives. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. May we feed on you, dear God, Jesus. Amen.